For those of you who have followed this channel for some time now, you may have noticed that I'm not exactly the biggest fan of AMD. Now hold on, let me explain. Because I don't dislike AMD or their products, I actually think they're forcing and leading innovation in the home computing market. But based on the experiences I've had in the past, I've always just felt like Intel was overall the better option if performance was your primary concern. But that all changes today. For $85, which is actually the price I paid for my FX6300 about three years back, the AMD Ryzen 5 1600 AF brings six true hyper-threaded processing cores to the masses. And if I were recommending a CPU, this chip is hands down the best budget recommendation I can make for mid-2020 gaming builds. However, what can you reasonably expect from such an inexpensive chip? Well, let's start off by taking a look under the hood. When looking at the actual chip itself, it's virtually identical to the base R5-1600 that it's replacing, and it actually behaves identically when the two chips are run in the same environment. But AMD has made a few changes under the hood to not only make it more affordable, but at absolutely no performance deficit. Architecturally, this chip uses a 12 nanometer Zen Plus refresh die, meaning that the physical silicon area that's taken up by the processing cores is smaller, when compared to an identical classic 14 nanometer Zen chip. All this really means is that not only do you get a small efficiency bump, but you can also produce each of these processors at less of a cost, reducing the market price for the consumer. And this really explains why these chips are flooding the market on Amazon and Newegg for such a low price. Keep in mind that when the 1600 first launched, you could expect to pay around 220 USD, and in less than three years that price has managed to drop to 38% of its original value. Yeah, it's kind of incredible. Now, I don't blame some of you for being skeptical about the chip, because up until I saw my first benchmark figures, I thought that this was going to have something left off. I mean, the best thing I can compare it to is the Intel F-Series. For a nice chunk of cash less, you get the full CPU power of the chip. The only downside is that you lose integrated graphics, which for some of us isn't really a big deal because we're going to pair it with a discrete graphics card anyways, but by specializing the product to only focus on CPU performance, they essentially alienated customers who are looking for cheap office PCs that run off the motherboard headers. In the same vein, I figured that there was going to be some variable that they tweaked to make the chip this much cheaper, and while they could have settled on smaller, less powerful mobile Zen cores, they instead gave us a full 6 cores and 12 threads using the full desktop Zen Plus microarchitecture. I guess a die shrink really can save them a lot of money. But looking at other specs of the chip, we've got a rather large cache size of 19 megabytes. In comparison, a 6 core offering from Intel only sports 9 megs, and we're also running at some pretty low clocks for 2020. I mean, don't get me wrong, this chip slays when it comes to gaming, but for those looking for an overclocking friendly budget CPU need look elsewhere. On my Ryzen 5, I was only able to get a stable overclock of 3.9GHz while putting a Corsair H115i on cooling duties. 300MHz of headroom obviously isn't much, but can I say that this chip runs very comfortably, even using the stock cooler, and with our overclock we never broke 60C during all but one benchmark. And getting started, the only software that forced our chip above the 60 degree mark was Cinebench R20. Obviously this is pretty self-explanatory, but I need to emphasize that this was run using the stock cooler, which you get for free with the chip. If you're really on a tight budget, this can help to conserve money for parts only affecting performance, but this can also not really matter if you're going to use a third party cooler. But I just thought I'd bring it up because you would never see a cooler ship with an overclocking friendly Intel chip. Then moving into performance figures, let's discuss our testing methodology. We first started with our AMD test bench. A Ryzen 5 1600 AF, 32 gigs of DDR4, a Samsung 970 EVO boot SSD, and a water-cooled GTX 1080 to pump out all them frames. And in the other corner, we've got our Intel comparison build, which features an i5 9600K, 32 gigs of DDR4, and the same Samsung 970 EVO and GTX 1080. RAM speeds were limited to 3200 MHz for both our rigs, just for consistency's sake, and we also ran all the following benchmarks using our stable overclock values. Also, if you want to see a complete spreadsheet of our benchmarking figures, I'll leave a document down in the description for those of you who are curious. Now, I've been keeping you waiting, so let's get into this. We first started with a workload that's actually subjected to both these machines on a pretty regular basis, and when it comes to rendering out our previous video at 4K 60fps, the Ryzen 5 actually beat out the Intel competitor, albeit not by a significant margin, but I'll take anyone I can get with this chip. 
And moving into gaming, when it comes to Modern Warfare, the Ryzen 5 continues to hold its own, even though it's starting to fall behind the i5. But I actually made a specific note about this in my benchmarking. The i5 had an overall higher average, but if you look at the minimum frame rates, the i5 stuttered a noticeable amount more. Probably due to it only having 6 threads as compared to the 12 from AMD, but when I ran both these games at a locked 60 FPS, I couldn't tell the difference between the two. Moving into Apex Legends, the story stays the same with the Ryzen chip lagging behind the less beefy Intel chip, but still delivering incredibly playable results. Unfortunately, however, the Ryzen 5 chip takes a step back in CSGO, seeing a max frame rate that sits almost in line with the i5's average frame rate. In fact, the i5's minimum frame rate was a good 40 frames higher than AMD's average. Obviously though, this is still very playable, but if you're all about getting them frames in Counter-Strike GO, then this is still a good option, but Intel provides a very tangible improvement for those ultra-high refresh rate gamers where even 144Hz just isn't enough. And looking at the rest of our benchmark figures, the Ryzen 5, while generally sitting behind the i5, is still holding its own, and is proving to be a very competent little chip for $85. I mean, even Crisis ran at very playable frame rates, but there definitely was more general slowdown on the Ryzen 5. This could be because Crisis favors single-threaded horsepower over multi-threaded prowess, but set the FPS cap to 60 and you're in for a more than impressive experience. Other games that ran well on this chip, and I thought were perfect to mention because of the notorious CPU dependency, such as GTA V, PUBG, and Battlefield 1, all ran very smoothly, and looking at the performance in context, these games never drop to what I would consider unplayable levels. Sure, the Ryzen 5 isn't matching the raw performance of the i5 competitor, but keep in mind that this CPU is available for $85 new. And if you're considering a processor from the blue team, the closest chip in terms of price is the i3-9100F, which can be found for anywhere between $70 to $90, and there you only get 4 cores and 4 threads, but admittedly, coffee late cores, curb stomp, sentence, and plus cores. <laughs> However, if you're building any sort of computer, whether it be for gaming, video editing, or streaming, then the 12 threads on offer in the AF revision are almost too good to be true. I mean, even if the Ryzen 5 can't quite beat out a 6-core, six 6-thread six offering from Intel, when it comes to doing anything other than gaming, the Ryzen 5 reigns king over any other similarly priced chip on the market. Even the latest Ryzen 3 3100 and 3300X have some stiff competition for this relatively modern and ultra-budget friendly processor. Now obviously this chip has limitations, Intel still holds the top performance spot when it comes to gaming, and there's no chance that this chip could stand toe to toe with something like an i9-9900K. Which is admittedly an unfair comparison because the i5 can't even come close to it either, but all I'm trying to say is that this chip is great for budget workstations and gaming systems. But if your workloads require both strong single and multi-core performance, then a Ryzen 3rd gen chip is probably the way to go. However, i7s, i9s, Ryzen 7s, and Ryzen 9s are still king when it comes to delivering the best of both worlds. Though I'm not trying to diminish the overall value of the Ryzen 5 1600 AF. For $85 new, this chip proves that AMD has come a long way from the dark days of Piledriver and Excavator. And as I previously mentioned, I paid the same price for an FX6300 only 3 years ago, and not gonna lie, that chip isn't really doing too well in 2020. While I'm not gonna be converting to the church of AMD, this value play is impressive as hell, and combined with the success of their Zen 2 chips, this shows me that AMD has some fire in their belly once again, which is kind of nice to see, because for someone who is still relatively young, Intel has dominated the home desktop market for basically as long as I can remember. In fact, some of my earliest computer memories were playing games in elementary school on a computer with a huge Intel inside sticker on the front of the case. So obviously they've been around for quite some time. But what I'm really excited about is how this chip will affect pricing of, honestly, more powerful Intel chips. Because looking at the i5-9400F, the thing can now be found for less than $120 new, which is an incredible value for the gaming-focused crowd. So then we have confirmation that Intel is aware of what's going on, and they're dropping prices to stay competitive. But for the 9th gen chips, I feel like it's already a little too late. With the 10th gen chips releasing in just a few days, which, make sure to subscribe for our 10th gen CPU reviews, it's going to be interesting to see how the market evolves, 
Because at the end of the day, when there's competition between the two big boys in the x86 market, that only means one thing for us, cheaper and more powerful hardware. So thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Just to look ahead a little bit, we've actually got some plans laid out to review one, possibly even more, Intel 10th Gen Core i-Series CPUs. Honestly though, I'm really excited because the i7-10700K is identical to an i9-9900K under the IHS, but it's like $200 cheaper. It's honestly just kind of crazy, but if you're interested, let us know in the comments and give us some games and programs you'd want us to benchmark on the new chips. But as for now, the Ryzen 5 1600 AF is an incredible CPU for the money, and if you have the budget, this chip is all I could ever ask for in such an inexpensive package.